Good afternoon, everybody. I think we discussed this actually in the first sem trimester of this year. I, th I think I remember saying to you that I wouldn't mislead you or anything, that I would just bowl the straight balls at you uh, throughout the first year. But I am reminded that we are in a university. We I do encourage you to challenge things. And I also remember that when I was a small boy, it was the practice to put silver sixpences in the Christmas pudding. I've no idea why people do that, but it's actually a European tradition. But you had to chew carefully, and that's the message. And I think you have to do that in a university. Chew carefully, because you never know when uh, someone's challenging you or appearing to mislead you, but to just to get you to own the subject. And I think it's true, uh, it will be true of a number of things that we do this in this uh, trimester. So the, the idea is to intellectually own what it is we're talking about. This is a particularly um, tricky development that we're going to talk about today, the vertigo effect. It's tricky to physically carry it out, and I'm hoping that by the end of the session you will have a certainly some ability to execute the, this development. But there's the other nagging problem, is that I've said to you anything that's in your film has to be justified. Anything that's in your film, you have put it there, and you have to say why it's there. So it's true of a tilt or a pan or a zoom or a crane, whatever it is you've done, there comes a point where you're going to have to say <coughs> to Mark and myself in a presentation, this is why we did it. And there, that must also apply to the vertigo effect. And as we talk about the history of this cinematographic effect, it's quite clear that it has to be justified. Otherwise, it's just a gratuitous bit of cleverness. OK? Now, there are, I suppose, if you're a student and you're looking for work, a bit of gratuitous cleverness is probably, you might think, is a good thing. And of course it is, because it's a skill. But all of these skills need to justify their place in your film. So let's start with this, uh, this effect. Several books have been written on Alfred Hitchcock. Someone was telling me that there are more books written on Hitchcock than all of the other directors put together. I, I somehow doubt that. But uh, it's one of those kind of uh, outrageous statistics, isn't it? But uh, this one, uh, which I've got on the screen now, is a good book. There's no question about that. Sterrett discusses a number of, of Hitchcock films. I think he makes 60 films, Hitchcock. I can't remember. He made a lot of films anyway. And, the, and the, some of them are discussed in here. And the, it's very informative. There are uh, seven, six, six, six of his films are discussed in here, one of which is Vertigo. And he says this. If there is one element that crystallizes the impact, ingenuity, and sheer strangeness of Vertigo, it is the repeated shot representing Scotty, that's the character, played by James Stewart, his troubled gaze into an abyss far below. Hitchcock achieved this effect of merciless disorientation by tracking away from the subject of the shot while simultaneously zooming towards it. Who's seen Vertigo? Right, some of you have seen it. OK. Um, he goes on. Uh, by combining the track out and zoom in, Hitchcock devised a shot with few uses in standard film nar narrative technique. Its usefulness in vertigo, however, is at least threefold. So what is happening here now is that David Sterrett is attempting to justify the use of this effect in the same way I would expect you to justify it if you'd put it in your film. Yeah? First, it provides a visual approximation of a psychological condition, extreme dizziness and disorientation, that is affecting, afflicting one of the film's protagonists, accomplishing this in a way that recalls, in its overt manipulation of reality, the German expressionism that influenced Hitchcock early in his career. Now, um, I've said to you, haven't I, I don't ever expect you to remember isms. I don't expect you to remember uh, words which sum up a concept necessarily. Um, what I do expect you to do is actually understand the concept. 
So um, expressionism, we discussed expressionism when we were talking about uh, Meyerholt and um, uh, the influences on Eisenstein. And I think I showed you, did I not, the opening of Juno and the Paycock by Alfred Hitchcock, where there were these grotesque faces. I essentially speaking, expressionism is about exaggeration. Exaggerated facial expressions, body gestures, that sort of thing. And this is, an ex this is an exaggeration of reality, in a sense. This is what Sterrett is claiming here. Second, it enhances audience identification with Scotty by providing information through his eyes, both physically and psychologically, carrying to new heights the point of view approach that had already served Hitchcock well for many years. Uh, we talked a lot about that in terms of rear window, didn't we, if you remember? We talked quite a bit about... Um, uh, point of view and the way that he um, this is his particular editing style which is reliant on point of view so Sterrett is saying this is another example of that um, and third it signifies ambiguous feelings of attraction and repulsion on Hitchcock's own part uh, this is interesting that he should mention this I think Hitchcock is fascinated by this I don't know what you call it but um, but you know, you know it because you know that if you're in a car driving down the motorway and there's been an accident on the other carriageway, everyone slows down to see what's happened. And it's in a sort of an attraction repulsion thing that goes on. Hitchcock had grasped that. Sterrett is trying to say that the vertigo effect might have something to do with that. Not that convinced, but it's, uh, it's a point. It's an interesting point to make. So uh, the, the plot, if you like, um, in uh, Vertigo, uh, it, it uh, surrounds this ex-policeman who has a fear of heights, that's acrophobia. And it manifests itself, as it does with many of us, if not, not all of us, in a certain dizziness when you look, o look down over from a height. Uh, is it Cloud 23? I can't remember. There's a, there's a, there's a floor in the, in the Hilton in Manchester that's got a glass panel and you can stand on it and look down. And people feel nervous about it. <laughs> you know, Jack shaking his head there. Um, there's one in Blackpool Tower as well. And it takes a bit of courage to step out onto it, even though you know it's a piece of glass that's, I don't know, several inches thick or something. So we do have this <coughs> attraction repulsion. And I suppose you could say that any funfair ride that's a bit frightening m makes use of this idea. Hitchcock was certainly interested in that. Um, and also, for good measure, uh, the, f the book I was just referring to is by David Sterrett in the Cambridge series of Cambridge Film Classic series. Uh, Robin Wood in two editions of uh, his book Hitchcock's Films Revisited. This is another, another great book. This, if you if you uh, uh, if, if you want to wade through it, and particularly on on s selected films, that it deals with film uh, a number of his good uh, his, his best known films. Um, he says this: the sense of vertigo is conveyed to the, conveyed to the spectator by the most direct means, subjective shots using a simultaneous zoom in and track back that makes the vast drop telescope out before our eyes okay so let me show you the effect now
that's the opening of the, the, the film. And uh, there are, I think, well, there are two other clips from the film that have contained this effect. And each, I think, has two instances of it. So let's have a look at one of those, if not both of them. Okay, and then there's a, a third pair. Okay, um, that's Vertigo. He then used it again, or something similar, not exactly the same, in Marnie, uh, which I'll come to in a moment. But first of all, I want to analyze the, the, uh, the physical nature of the effect. And it seems uh, to me that there are two distortions. Uh, there's a, a foreground and a background. We'll look at the foreground one first. But it, in considering both of them, I've drawn you some diagrams which should make clear what it is we're talking about. So if you imagine on the left-hand side there, those two triangles with the, with the funny little threepenny bit shaped, not quite circles, are they, in, in, the middle of the, in the middle of the drawing. That represents two camera positions, a farther position, which is the one with the sh on the sharp triangle, the sharp pointed triangle, and the nearer position, uh, which is the w which is the other one? The camera in the farther position is zoomed in to uh, to show only a small part of the back wall, and in the in the camera that's tracked in to the nearer position, that's zoomed out. Okay, so if we're if we're tracked back, we're zoomed in. If we're tracked in we're zoomed out. Is that okay with everyone? Uh, the important thing about this is that there are two pillars which I've uh, asked you to imagine that have faces on them. They're not circular cross-sectional pillars. There's, they've got, and the, the reason for this will become apparent, but they have faces. And the faces are different colours. And those colours are evident on the two uh, rectangles on the right hand side. The bit of blue in the middle is the back wall. Okay? And the, the two pillars are on the edge of both shots. You can see from the triangles that I've drawn that they're on the edge of the frame in both cases. Does that make sense? So it doesn't matter where the camera is. The, the zoom 
has been adjusted so as to place them on the edge. Right. Now then, this is the important thing to grasp. The appearance of the pillars is different in the two positions for very obvious reasons. If you are tracked in, you're going to be able to see more of the faces which are facing e each other. Let's call them the <coughs> nine, nine o'clock and the three o'clock, or the three o'clock and the nine o'clock position, because if it was a clock and you were looking down on it, those faces would be at three o'clock and nine o'clock, yeah? Does that make sense? Um, so if the camera is pushed forward, you will see those faces much better than you can from the other position, the farther position, where they will be more oblique. Uh, equally, the two faces which are, are uh, facing the, the, the camera uh, are, um, let us call them the six o'clock positions, because if, if they were clocks, that's where six o'clock would be. The six o'clock positions on those columns uh, would appear differently if you would push the camera right up. You would get a more oblique, foreshortened view of those two faces. Whereas if you were tracked back into the farther position, you would see the full, the full thing. You would almost be looking full on, yeah? But if you got nearer, it would be more oblique. Yes, does that make sense? Okay, that's the foreground, what I'm calling foreground distortion. Now, on the back wall, I put that picture of Alfred H. He always appeared in his own films, you're aware of that, aren't you? He always had a bit part, a wall compartment. But I put a picture on the wall and it's just big enough on that wall to fill the frame when, there's, when the camera is zoomed in. But when the camera is zoomed out, it's only taking up a, just slightly more than a third of the back wall. So in the, zoom, in the tracked in zoomed out position, which I'm calling the nearer position, we're seeing quite a bit of blue wall. But in the other one, we're seeing much less, and Hitchcock appears to be closer. So the, it is apparent that in the farther position, the background is nearer. And in the nearer position, when you're next to the pillars, it's looking further away. In essence, this is the effect. Are we okay with that? Right. Um, and there are the two put together for your further consideration. Let's have a look at, a, at some examples. We've seen the vertigo effect. I think the next thing to show you is the Marnie effect, or what I'm calling the Marnie effect. And this is where, instead of um, starting the farther position, moving to the near position and zooming out as you go, the opposite effect happens. Let's have a look at it. Back to sleep, sugar pot. Bernice? The story, the plot is that there's this very disturbed young lady called Marnie, and she has something in her past which was uh, traumatic. And I think this is supposed to be it, basically, this little scene here. That she is the child, the mother is a prostitute. They may well be in a city in America which is a, a port, there's a sailor. I think the implication is that she murders him. The mother murders this man. Although it's not shown in the film, as so far as I remember. But the little girl uh, is uh, turfed out of her bed. She sleeps in, I think there's a one-room flat, she sleeps in the same bed as her mother. And when a customer comes, she has to go and uh, sleep in the chair in 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 the uh, in the living room, and this all comes back in the in the film. So we have this effect used to symbolise her discomfort with this part of her um, part of her past. Let's have another look at it. 
And I want you to take special note of the two frames I've displayed for you here. And uh, when we were talking about a few moments ago about the appearance of the, of the pillar, the pillars that I'd drawn for you, in this case, uh, it's the fireplace which is the giveaway because in the very first frame, you can see into the fire hole almost. You can see into the, uh, not up the chimney quite, you know, but you can see into the fireplace. Whereas in the final picture, it's foreshortened. This is like the three o'clock, nine o'clock faces on the pillars, isn't it? You, can, you can't see them as well in the farther position because they're oblique. And that's the same with this and the cupboard on the other side on, in, this, in, this, in this illustration. So let's just watch that again. So you can see into the fireplace, but as the development occurs, the fireplace becomes more oblique Come on, and the background comes towards us. Okay? okay? Now there are all sorts of names for this effect. Some of the, the D zone dozy are often used. Dolly in, zoom out. Dolly out, zoom in. People, there are names people have invented. It's much more sensible, in my view, to say the vertigo effect and the Marnie effect, and that's what I've always done. And I would encourage you to comply with that uh, form of naming because it makes perfect sense to us, doesn't it? Uh, it there's also another one in uh, Walkabout. This is quite an interesting. One. Anybody seen Walkabout? No! I know. Will that be there? No. Oh. Is he dead too? I'm not sure. Did he shoot himself? It was an accident. So the, the village, or whatever it is, this little cluster of uh, houses, uh, recedes. Okay, did you spot that? I mean, it's a bit subtle. The other clever thing is actually the characters are walking from one side to the other, so the track must be at an angle to the to the to the shot. Normally, to make life easy for yourself, you would make the two the same, but he, he's obviously uh, thought a lot about the geometry of this. And I mean, do, you, do you want to watch that one again? In terms of justification, and I don't want to spend a lot about this, I've told you if you put something in your film, you've put it there, it's there because it's, you've decided it's there, and if you're going to, uh, to um, use any effect or uh, transition or whatever it is, you have to <coughs> say why, um, otherwise it's just a gratuitous use of, uh, of something. However, I don't want to spend a lot of time discussing the justifications in some of these other examples. The film is essentially it, it re revolves around two children who are from a city uh, which will have uh, European type attributes and uh, culture and they get lost in the outback and they're befriended by an Aboriginal boy who can live in the outback in a way that uh, probably people of European ethnicity can't and he kind of looks after them a little bit and so on and so forth and then eventually they go back to and I use the words in inverted commas, civilization, because it seems to me that he has a, a pretty uh, sophisticated civilization as well. But that's the sort of message that I think we're getting from the film. And when they make that transition back, we have this effect. I don't think we need to say too much about it. The fact is it's very well executed. It's very well thought through. And it's certainly an enhancement uh, to the film. Moving on then to perhaps a more famous film in which there is a vertigo effect. This is Steven Spielberg. <laughs> OK. What was it? What happened? Um, the guy's focusing. Well, how did the effect work? How was it done? Sorry? 
Right. Anybody uh, disagree with that? Anybody agree with it? Have a look at it again. Or have a look at the first shot and the last shot. In this shot, we can't see the hut. In this shot, the end shot, we can. The likelihood is then it's a zoom out. And if it's a zoom out, it's a track in. Do I see it again? In fact, the camera has got a little bit nearer to, the, to Roy Scheider hasn't it, than, than we would have expected. But of course, it's about his realisation that there's a shark in the pool, isn't it? That's what it's about. It's about a sudden, dramatic realisation that there's something wrong, yeah? So they've done it by um, tracking in and zooming out. And if it wasn't a zoom out, you wouldn't have got the terrific difference in the width of the background. Yeah? Okay. The Goodfellas is another good example of uh, this uh, particular technique. But what do they do in Goodfellas? Let's have a quick look. There are loads of these examples. I'm not going to show all of them, all of the ones even that I've got. He's the most in need of their help. So I met Jimmy in a crowded place we both knew. I got there 15 minutes early and I saw that Jimmy was already there. He took the booth near the window so we could see everyone who drove up to the restaurant. He wanted to make sure I wasn't tailed. He was jumpy. He hadn't touched a thing. On the surface, of course, everything was supposed to be fine. We were supposed to be discussing my case, but I had the feeling Jimmy was trying to sense whether I was going to rat him out to save my neck. I've been telling you your whole life. Don't talk on a fucking phone, right? Now you understand, huh? It's gonna be okay. I think you got a good chance of being the case. Okay. Any offers? What happens there? The background there. The background, yeah. Does it seem to recede or approach? It gets closer. So it's a zoom. <coughs> I watched that the other day. Yeah. It's oh, well, it's obviously a zoom in, isn't it? It's got to be a zoom, a zoom in, isn't it? Yeah. But here's another clue. This is the first shot. In each case, this is the, the left hand shot is the first shot. The right hand shot's the second shot. So, okay, the, the the end shot. Sorry, yeah, that's the end shot. That's the first. That's the first shot. We're looking down on the table. It's not foreshortened in the same way that this one is. Yeah. So this is like this foreshortening effect I was telling you with the pillars. It's the same principle. If you're looking down on a table, where are you? Are you closer or further, f farther away? You're closer, aren't you? You're looking down on it. You've got close enough to look down on it. So, so we're close here. And here we're farther away. So it's a zoom, it's, it's a zoom in. It's a track out. This, the camera tracks from this position to this position, farther away, and the zoom does the opposite, if you like. Are we okay with that? Takes a bit of thinking about, doesn't it? Right. Um, now, um, I did point out that uh, students who can do this effect kind of put it into, uh, into um, their films, and this is Mario Nikai who did a kind of, there was no wheelchair involved. I think it was a sort of a walk he did it with. It was, he did it in a first year film, I seem, seem to remember. Sorry, no, it was second year film. Um, and I'll just show it to you because uh, I thought he did very well. He got a very good mark. He's a very good filmmaker. What's that? the two people stationary in the shot and the background falls away yeah it's some kind of zombie type film there you know used to get a sort of a used to get a rash of these every now and again this is a zombie-ish sort of thing you know mm -hmm. this one is a, a short story by JG Ballard and I think the story is called the enormous space 
The plot basically is about someone who's had a very bad car accident and has been off work for a long while. And during this, this time, his marriage is broken up. And this is the day he goes back to work and he can't leave the house. He never actually leaves the house. He, he, he starts the car to go to work and leaves it on the drive with the engine running and it just stays there until it runs out of petrol some days or weeks later, you know. And he stays in the house and he ends up eating the cat and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's a really very dark story. Um, however, he imagines during this time that the house is getting bigger. And of course, this is an open goal for the director who decided that uh, a, vertigo, a couple of vertigo effects might, might enhance this, this strange feeling. That's quite interesting because the, the t there are two functions, aren't there? You move the camera and you also zoom. You also zoom the lens, and in that case, uh, he seems to walk away from the camera at the very beginning of the develop, and then it develops as you would expect it to, with the background falling away as the camera gets closer to him. Um, I'll just show you that again because, oops, quite subtle. What happens there technically, I think, is that the track starts after the zoom starts. Here's the other example. <laughs> So uh, just observing this, uh, this, this ready reckoner I've given you here, um, this uh, easy, easy peasy way of working out what's happening, the background has seemed to recede. As you can see, the mirror is larger in this shot than in this shot, which is a result of the zoom out. And the door is more oblique in this position than it is in this position can see more of the door, which means the camera must be closer. So the camera starts here, gets closer here, and at the same time, it, as it gets closer, it zooms out and widens the shot. Everybody okay with this? Right. And that's essentially what's happening in Vertigo, isn't it? The height seems to increase. Okay. Now here's a strange use of the effect. This is a version of, of these effects which doesn't look quite as obvious because actually the background stays the same size and it's the foreground that changes um, in its um, uh, relative size. This one, if it has a justification at all, is because the presenter is in the repository of Acts of Parliament. I don't know where that is actually, but somewhere I presume in London. Every act that has been passed by Parliament ends up on a piece of parchment in this building. So they're talking about, the, the, the presenter is talking about the huge repository 
of stuff. So this is the idea of a large space, if you like, or a large number of objects in a space. And that's what sort of justifies it. But just have a look at it, because it's different from what you've seen so far. In 1799, Parliament passed an act designed to raise revenue. In typically flowery language, the preamble explains what they intended to do. That we, your majesty's most dutiful and loyal subjects, do voluntarily grant your majesty... So instead of having, doing what I did when I was mimicking the vertigo effect in, in Hitchcock, where I was, I'd put, posited two pillars that would be uh, marking the edge of the shot, and allowing the background to, to drop away, yeah? Instead of doing that, what's happening here is that the, um, the distance between the, the two um, bookcases or whatever is exactly the same. Um, but the camera has clearly moved forward because this, it's, it's fairly oblique, the top, the top of the trolley here, but when in this shot, we're obviously looking down on it. We haven't altered the height of the camera. The height of the camera is the same. You can tell from this horizontal bar here. That's the same. That hasn't, so the camera hasn't tilted. The camera is still on the level. However, we can see th nearly three whole lamps in the ceiling here and only two and a half here. So the camera has got closer. And correspondingly, the, the camera is tracked in and it's zoomed out, but it's zoomed out in such a way to retain that size. So that's something we haven't seen so far. Again, the justification I've given you, such as it is, very weak, but I did spot a similar one in a, in a, in a film on TV only a couple of weeks ago. I don't know whether anyone caught Witness, Witnesses, a French series called Witnesses, A Frozen Death. It was a particularly dark, a crime drama uh, on um, BBC Four, nine o'clock Saturday nights. Well worth a watch if you're so sad that you're staying on Saturday nights. This is complicated to some degree by the fact there's a tilt up. But before the tilt up happens, the car has got nearer. And the, the width of the building, uh, the, this is Mont Saint Michel, I'm sure you recognize. Mont Saint Michel in northern France. Uh, it hasn't actually altered very much at all. It's slightly uh, narrower here, but it's basically the same size. The height of the, <coughs> the, the uh, the, this uh, tower is nearer uh, the top of the frame uh, than it is in this in this case. Uh, but essentially, the background has remained the same size. And then, then in the next shot, the same thing happens. Although it's not quite so obvious because in the next shot, it's just a bit of skyline, um, and you can't clearly uh, see quite what's happening there. But I'll just I'll play you the whole thing again. <laughs> Okay, if you look at what you can see in the background, there's a, a clump of trees on the very right hand end of the frame. And you can see the, uh, I won't describe it to you, you can see the terrain on the left hand side. They hardly change at all, but the car recedes enormously. So this is um, a slightly different use of the effect. And I wouldn't like to venture to ju justify why it's in the film. <laughs> I'm sure I could if, I, if you gave me long enough. Let's move on to the next example. Now, in this example, this is all interesting for a couple of reasons. There is a development involving the track and the zoom, 
in this, but there's also a morphing thing that you can do, after effects and things like that. The justification in the plot is that uh, Poirot is asleep and he's on a case and he has a, has a sudden realisation that two of the people in the murder investigation, two people, are related to one another. I can't remember now what it is, but there is a, a family relationship and when he realises that, that this then becomes a motive. The murder will be solved by realising this connection that wasn't seemingly there before. And that's what the morphing of the face is all about. But the act of realisation is done with the, uh, the vertigo effect. Monsieur Poirot. Mademoiselle, please be careful as you go. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> You know, you could do far worse than watch some of these things. There's hugely interesting things occur in these two-hour whodunits. Um, and you can tell that that's been repeated. When they've had a run on ITV, they, they then go on to ITV3, which is just permanently about these whodunits. The foil, Foils War has been running. They're very, very good. The production values are huge, you know. And you can learn all sorts of stuff from them. So please, I do urge you, as I always do, watch some more of these things. Anyway, that's that particular one. Um, it is a cliché, and you should avoid clichés, I suppose. On the other hand, the cliché is just making use of something, that, something that's been established. And everything we do in, the, in film and TV is metaphor, really, or certainly some sort of symbolism. And symbols only work with a convention. Well, what's convention, but another word for a cliché, you know, or something that's been used before. I think at that point, we need to think about going and having a look in the corridor with the wheelchair. Okay, um, anyone got any observations? I, I began this, the session by advising you that, that this has been covered in various books on Hitchcock, and I'm, the first one I showed you was this one, and I, I gave you uh, some quotations from it. Um, any observations given what's happened since the beginning of the session? On that first slide, he says in the second, on the same page, by combining the track out and zoom in, Hitchcock devised a shot with few uses. Is that what you've just done? No. What was it? What did we just do? We tracked in and zoomed out. So Aidan Lawler wishes to argue with the writer of this, eminent writer of this book, as indeed he also wants to argue with the writer of this book, who also says, who's, who agrees with Aidan? No I agree with Aidan. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else agree with Aidan? Does that everybody? Yeah. The book's wrong. The book's got it wrong. Both books have got it wrong. I don't think that's particularly remarkable, because you can pick up a book any time that's got something, something that's incorrect. But why do you think it is that you spotted it and these guys who wrote these books didn't? What's the difference between them and you? Practical experience, I guess. Like, if they, they might not come in.
You're suggesting that people write books on this subject without ever getting a camera out of a bag. We could watch the film. Yeah. That's true. It's true. This is the problem with the academic world. There are plenty of people to tell you how to do things and tell you things, but they don't show you. The point about PSVT, and I would, I would, I would remember this, PSVT is not only about uh, being told things, it's about being shown things and giving you the opportunity to show us <coughs> things. And I think that's what's missing from, in the academic world, they just stand in front of you and tell you things. We make you do it. And I think that's the strength of PSVT, quite frankly. In, um, in lots of subjects uh, in universities, that somebody stands in front of you and talks to you, and there might be 200 of you and just talks to you for an hour, but you've got to actually do it, and that's what's obviously missing here. Neither of these guys, uh, and other people have made the same mistake, none of the, neither of these guys has got a camera out of a bag, that the strength that you have is that you can do it. I mean, I don't suppose anybody would want to put the, the exercise that you've just shot now in, your, in their showreel, would they? I don't suppose. But you know how to do it. I don't think that's important. I hope you enjoyed it as well. <laughs>